Hello again, how you doing? This is Abnormal Psychology, and today we're going to talk about Depressive Disorders, Part 1. Please hit the like or unlike button, depending on whether you like it or not, and hit the uh, uh, subscribe and, uh, and the button, the, the bell that tells you when a new video is up. That would be appreciated, but it's not necessary. If you want to do it, great. Okay, Depressive Disorders. We're going to talk about this category, and, and then specifically, we're going to talk about major depressive disorder and persistent depressive disorder. Okay? All right. So let's talk first about major depressive disorder. Um, depression is misunderstood. It's not what many people think it is, which is a sadness that overcomes people, and that if they just pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and got out of bed and went about it, that the feelings would, would disappear. That's not depression. That's ordinary sadness. That's, that's a grieving response, maybe, although grieving can be very severe and look like depression and even develop into depression. But that's not depression. Depression is they can't, they can't make themselves. They are, they are completely amotivational in some cases. In other cases, they can go about their lives when the depression is mild. And you might not even know that they're depressed. They don't even look sad. They can put on a, a face that hides their depression. Well, how do we diagnose this? There are five of nine symptoms that must be present, five or more, during a two-week period, two weeks. Okay, And it has to be a change from normal emotional condition and normal functioning. Excuse me, the seat keeps... i got a terrible chair. i got to get a new one. And two of the symptoms must, one of the symptoms must either be depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day, and that means sadness, emptiness, hopelessness, okay, or loss of pleasure, what we call anhedonia, lack of pleasure, hedonism, anhedonia. So there is a marked, usually a marked disinterest, disinterest, in pleasurable activities most of the most of the time but you usually get that plus you usually get the other as well of the first two you get that depressed mood of of sadness and emptiness and hopelessness you don't think anything's going to get better you feel kind of hollowed out and sad um there may be and often is a weight change that was unintentional uh usually weight loss but there can be weight gain when people eat comfort foods in excess and then they don't move very much and as a result of that they tend to gain weight rapidly um there may be insomnia and that may be difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep and a real marker for significant depression would be getting up early four or five in the morning, can't get back to sleep. Combined with other symptoms, that would be a, a signal of depression for sure, um, in the absence of other reasons for that. <laughs> okay. Um, now, some people go in the opposite direction. They are hypersomniacs. They sleep all the time and have trouble getting out of bed. That can happen too. Um, there's something called, and I don't like the term, psychomotor retardation. So that's a slowing of your movements. You move more slowly. You respond more slowly. Sometimes there's agitation. Uh, periods of great agitation. Generally speaking, and often is fatigue and loss of energy associated with this. Feelings of worseless worthlessness, worthlessness excessive or inappropriate, what we call pathological guilt, a lot of it. I should have, I didn't, I'm a bad person for whatever reason. In severe forms of depression, it can get so severe that actually you are uh, have delusions of pathological guilt, where you actually believe you've done horrible things and that the devil is inside you and things like that. Diminished ability to concentrate, think, indecision, getting things done. Recurrent thoughts of death can occur, not in every case, but in many. 
um, recurrent suicidal ideation may be present with or without any specific plan to hurt oneself. There is a way to measure that using separate scales and a good interview when that issue comes up, if they mention it or when if you ask about it and they mention it, that they're thinking about hurting themselves, you, you need to, you have to. It's unethical to not go through a process of determining their lethality okay, and then take appropriate action from that. So you can imagine that if it's any more than mild depression that people can function within or separate from, uh, that this will cause distress and impairment in daily functioning, particularly in relationships and at work. Yeah. I mean, you could sit at the back of a classroom and not speak. You might have trouble concentrating and doing work and getting things done. Yes. But boy, it would have an immediate impact, uh, depending on the kind of work you had, but certainly in relationships. A good way to remember the symptoms is to use a medical school uh, uh, acronym called SIG E CAPS, S I G, SIG E, and then the word CAPS, C A P S, SIG E CAPS. S stands for sleep, more or less. Interest, diminished, that's the I. G is guilt, feelings of worthlessness. Uh, energy, which is loss of, that's the E in the middle. CAPS starts with C, which is diminished concentration. A is appetite, either more or less. The P is psychomotor agitation or psychomotor retardation. And the S is suicidal ideation. Siggy caps. It's a good one to remember. Now, in children and adults, there are differences in the way the symptoms look. Okay? So, in uh, ch younger children, they may really have things like sadness and irritability often and worries. Okay? They may exhibit more of those things than they did. Um, in children and teens, they often have acting out behaviors. Uh, uh, so they may, they may just have other things that, that they're doing that signals that they, what, you're developing ADHD or so? That, so it's, it may not be that, it could be the depression. Um, they may begin to become ill physically ill, um, all sorts of things. Um, changes in thinking and changes in sleep are not typical in depression in adults or in adolescents. Okay, young adults probably, but uh, in children maybe. They're not, but they're not common in younger children. So it really depends. Now, these are all averages. This does not refer to any one person. There are differences from person to person about how many symptoms they have overall, not just five. They may have six, seven, eight, nine, or you know, all of them. They may have different amounts of each of those. They may have any level of depression. It may vary from week to week as to how much depression they have, you see. Okay. In older adults, this disorder is often missed. It's missed because some of the behaviors we attribute to being old are overlapping symptoms of depression, like lack of energy or problems sleeping, for example. Um, so we have to be very um, attuned to this. Older people will often talk about the dissatisfaction they have with life in general. They, they may feel helpless or bored or worthless. They may want to stay home when they didn't before. And by the way, older men without a partner are particularly high risk for depression, as are college age and college attending females. We have all sorts of things that can go with this with what we call specifiers. In other words, major depressive disorder, and you want to, spe you want to say mild, moderate, severe, those are specifiers. But it could even be uh, a kind of si significant depression so severe that they have a psychosis. They may hallucinate or have delusions. It can be impartial or full remission. It can have anxiety attached to it. In fact, what we sometimes call an anxious depression is very common. It can have atypical features, ones that are not common. Okay. It can have what's called catatonia, where you can't move 
easily with all parts of your body. You may be able to talk or move a bit or stand up, but it's very slow and labored movement. And sometimes you freeze in certain positions for a while. That's called waxy flexibility. It can occur near the time of uh, uh, giving birth. That's called peripartum onset. And it can be seasonal which we used to call seasonal affective disorder, and now it's simply just another kind of major depressive disorder. Well, it's more common in women, and why? You would know, wouldn't you? And the answer, of course, is that women are more likely to be victimized. They have greater role strain and role stress, and they have biological differences. An interesting statistic to remember is that major depressive episodes typically last between six and nine months, and that if it's untreated the first time, although the first episode may go away on its own, ultimately, you stand a much greater chance that you'll have a second. If you have a second, much greater chance of a third, and so on. If untreated. If treated and you have recurrent episodes, you still have that increased risk, but the risk is slightly less. If treated effectively, the risk goes down more. But we want to treat it early, and we want to include, if it's moderate to severe, both psychotherapy and medication. And the medications we want to use are probably SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSNRI, selective serotonin reuptake and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and that's because those seem to have a protective and additive effect of generating new cells in the hippocampus. So it actually prevents cellular loss and improves cellular generation. Now that's important because if you're not treated, you're diminishing cells in your hippocampus, which among other things might affect memory. The hippocampus is in some ways associated with other processes, so it would not just affect that, but other things as well. Okay, so what are some other interesting things? Well, we have something called the Western States Depression Band, so that Western states like Arizona, New Mexico, all the way up to Montana, including Idaho and Wyoming and Utah and so on, we're not sure why. Maybe it's lack of population and isolation, don't know. We also see it in much greater amounts in the South, from Oklahoma all the way over to the East Coast, particularly Mississippi, uh, Alabama, Louisiana, uh, Tennessee, and West Virginia. Some of that has to do with poverty, lack of medical care, and so on. So we should also recognize that there are many things that can create depression that are physical disorders, things like systemic lupus erythematosus, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes mellitus, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, Cushing's disease, mitral valve prolapse, men who, in particular men, who have had a heart attack or bypass surgery, gastrointestinal disorders, nutritional dis dis deficiencies like B12 and iron. So there are different forms of anemia, and um, some of those are uh, more responsible for things like depression, encephalitis, hepatitis, infectious mononucleosis, pneumonia, tuberculosis, renal failure, uremia, psoriasis. There's lots of stuff. That's a tiny little amount. So if you've got someone who is not responding to treatment, either psychotherapy and or medication, now I want to revisit that. If you have mild depression, we'll go with psychotherapy to see if that works. With moderate to severe, as I said before, we want both talk therapy and medication. But if none of that works for someone, and you know nothing else is going on to attribute it, we may think we can't find the answer, but another possibility is that something is being missed physically. And if they have the right insurance and the right doctor, or they have money, they can go through a series of basic tests, which might then lead to other tests if indicators are present. So you'll go down the list of percentages of the disorders that cause 
you know, what percentage of this disorder causes uh, depression? And you'll go down that list in some ways and then choose the right tests from those higher order, higher percentage disorders that might then lead to lower ones later to be tested. Now, drugs can create depression. Barbiturates, any nervous system uh, depressants or even stimulants for that matter. Um, beta blockers, corticosteroids, uh, things that control swelling and pain and arthritis, oral contraceptives, just all sorts of things. Now, the onset of depression can either be sudden or gradual. And as I said before, you can have someone with a diagnosed case of depression, and the depression seems to be lessening, and all of a sudden it gets, the bottom drops out. Or you can have someone in the reverse position. They're slowly sinking, and then all of a sudden they get better. Without treatment, but more commonly with treatment in that case. Okay? Just to give you an idea, full recovery from an episode after having it for six months, where it was not treated properly or it was untreated, the full recovery, in other words, getting back to normal euthymic state, is about 50%. And a, a percentage of people with diagnosed med, uh, major depressive disorder go on to then show w at least one episode of mania, which would tell us that they have actually bipolar disorder. But we couldn't have known that. We had to see then the manic episode or, or part of it to, to see that they actually had bipolar disorder. So again, that's about 5 or 10%, something like that. Okay, so what are the things that happen in most cases of, of this disorder? We, talk, we have talked before, and I think you know, that the misuse or inadequate use or suddenly stopping or not even ever taking the medication that was prescribed is very common, particularly in depression, for a lot of reasons. And that contributes to relapse. So things like high previous number of episodes contributes to relapse. Inadequate antidepressant treatment, the wrong, wrong kind of medication, that they didn't find the right one for you, and often that's a process that we have to warn patients about as therapists and doctors. We have to remind them that that's going to take a while to get the right one, to try different ones in different dosages. So that's one possibility for relapse. Partial response, not full response to the treatments offered. Stopping treatment, rapidly stopping treatment like antidepressants, just stopping, that, ooh. That brings about relapse often. Returning from your office to, or to going to and living in a highly emotional, inconsistent environment, an invalidating or abusive environment, yeah. Having other disorders makes it more difficult, often results in relapse. Yeah, okay. What else comes with, uh, um, uh, what else do you see with this? Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about what things could exist before, which then may have caused the depression. Lots of things, many things, most things. Uh, substance abuse, panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders, borderline personality disorder, bipolar disorder. But can it work the other way around? Can depression cause these things? Maybe. Certainly depression can cause substance abuse problems. Okay, we know that. And we think that depression can create vulnerability to the development of some other conditions. But it's more likely a result of other conditions than a, for, than a forerunner to other conditions. Okay. The most common assessment tool for major depressive disorder, or just for levels of depression, even just for the symptoms of depression, is the Beck Depression Inventory developed by Aaron Beck, the fellow who developed cognitive therapy. Later, later, many people then merged that with behavior therapy to create cognitive behavior therapy. But he, had a, he has a 21 uh, item list that talks about various kinds of symptoms associated with depression more than you might uh, uh, first think about when you say Siggy Caps, remember? Um, and it's a zero to three scale where that he says, you know, sadness, if you feel sadness, 
in the, have you felt sadness in the past week? So all of these are measured in the past week. Any of these in the past week to any degree? No, I didn't feel sad any day. One, I did. Two, I'm sad and I can't get snap out of it. And three, I'm so sad that I can't stand it. And then you have point total thresholds for no depression versus mild, moderate, and severe. Anything over about 30 total points is severe depression. This is easy to give, easy to score, just a minute to take. 30 seconds to, to score, and you can track a patient who's depressed by giving it to them at the beginning of every single session. You can see whether they're getting better or not, and you also might detect the suicidal ideation. Um, they might disclose it on the, on the BDI and not tell you verbally. That, that happens. Well, what are the risks in developing this from... Uh, the origins within one's life. Well, correlated to neuroticism, which is essentially negative affectivity. Childhood trauma and stress, including abuse. Abuse is a forerunner for most things that we look at uh, as psychiatric slash psychological disorders. Um, pathological families, pathologically commun communicative, pathologically uh, bo lack of appropriate boundaries and so on. Um, genetic and physiological, well, we see a much higher risk across generations. That's been shown even when those generations were not in contact with each other. So we believe there is a strong genetic and physiological set of components. We think the heritability is somewhere around 30 or 40 percent, something like that, for this disorder. Um, and so uh, I want to go to Part three. See you in a second.